Y'all look good out there tonight. And, on, and online, too, I'm sure you're looking good out there. So are y'all ready? I'm excited about, the, about tonight. Tonight and next week, we're going to be studying the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, so that's what we're going to study. We're going to get through that, I hope, tonight and next Wednesday night. But why don't, before we start, why don't we just, uh, we just, let's bow our heads and let the Holy Spirit teach us tonight, okay? You know, He is the teacher. And so we have to give Him permission to speak to our heart. And um, as I've been studying this for, well, I've, I've been meditating on it for quite a while now, um, uh, I've ne- the Holy Spirit has really dealt with my heart on spiritual gifts, and so we'll get into all that, okay? But let's just let's just bow our heads and let's just open our heart. Father, we thank you that we're all here together. We're your church, Lord. We're your people, and Father, you have a word to speak to us tonight of encouragement, and of edification, and of comfort. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we will open our heart and that we will walk out of here differently. Maybe, God, that we would, we would just, a light bulb may go off inside of us, God, that we would desire more of you in our life. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't that what it's all about, just desiring more of the Lord? Do you ever want to get to the place where you plateau in God? Anybody ever want to get there? <laughs> I don't think any of us want to get there. I think we want to go from glory to glory, don't we? We want to keep we want to keep learning. You know, we'll spend, once we get to heaven, you realize, I hope you realize, we will spend all of eternity learning more about God. Isn't that going to be glorious? It's going to be wonderful. So um, I have, I have uh, studied quite a bit for these lessons that I'm going to teach tonight and next Wednesday night, and I have pulled from a lot of resources. Uh, I love to study. I've got a lot of great study Bibles and study notes and uh, great men that I've, I've studied after. And so, uh, and then some of this is me too, okay, <laughs> that I've kind of thrown in there. But um, it's great to have good teachers that pour into your life. Aren't you glad that our pastor is a master teacher? I love to hear Pastor Bob teach, and uh, sincerely. I mean, you, you just, we are so blessed in this church to have a pastor that has such a he, he, he knows how to dig out the truths of God's Word, and somehow or another, I find myself that they get planted in my heart. How did that happen? <laughs> Isn't that great when that happens? So um, anyways, let's, let's delve into this. Um, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit for weeks and weeks and weeks now, and I hope that you've enjoyed that. And you know, you heard Pastor Bob say that we could spend, we could spend from now till Jesus comes talking about the Holy Spirit because He is God. How c- you can never exhaust the study of God. And so um, God loves people. I want, I want to get this in our spirit before we start this series, uh, this lesson tonight, from tonight, next week. I want you to understand how much God loves people. Now, we know God loves us. He sent Jesus to die for us, right? But God loved us so much that he didn't just want to save us. He wanted to be inside of us. And so God dwells within his people through the person of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about that for weeks. Uh, But we're on a journey. All of us in this room, we're on a journey. We're daily walking with the Lord. And hopefully we're communing with him. Like, you know, wasn't that a great message Sunday morning? Pastor Barry, the visual that we got. Communing with the Holy Spirit, communing with the Lord. I hope that you've taken time this week to do that because God loves you. Did you get that Sunday morning that God is sitting there? The Lord is waiting on us to show up. That's how much he loves us. He wants to have that time with us. And so God, I want you to understand, God loves the church. Now, who is the church? We're the church, right? We're the collective body. There's a church registered in heaven. There's a church registered on earth, and we are the church on earth right now, and God loves the church. That's why we have, that's why God has given the church these phenomenal gifts, because God loves people. And there's a work that what God wants to do in the earth through the church. Everybody got that? We all know that, right? There's a, I'm going to say that again. There is a work that God desires to do in the earth today, and he uses 
the church. God has to have a, he has to have a vessel to flow through and to flow out of. That's why His Spirit indwells us. God needs you. You know, it's not very likely that Jesus is going to just, you know, get off the throne and pop in this service tonight and walk down the aisle and minister to you. Really? That's not going to happen. God is going to use, use people. He's going to, the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, that dwells within me, He, 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 he works through us and, and His gifts are manifested through us for the church. Now, if the gifts are not in operation, there's a problem. If you will look, let's, before, I may be getting ahead of myself, but I want, us to, I want to establish this right now on the front end. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is not on the screen. But if you'll turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Everybody got your Bible? Okay, 1 Corinthians 14. Look at verse 1. Now, Paul's speaking to us. Y'all are the Wednesday night crowd. Y'all have come to grow, right? We want to grow. We want to hear something that we may grow thereby, right? Okay, look at this. Here's, here's the command. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Why would God speak to the church and say, I need you to desire spiritual gifts? Because God loves people. God wants to help people, and he helps, he helps people, he helps the church through the giftings that we're going to talk about tonight. Now, if they're not in operation, if we do not desire spiritual gifts, okay, I want you, everybody, don't raise your hand. Everybody just do what I've had to do the last several weeks as I've meditated on this. If we're not seeing spiritual gifts manifested in our lives to the degree we would like to, maybe it's because we're not desiring them. I think I can speak for our whole pastoral staff. We, we desire. Why do you think that Pastor Bob has called our church to prayer every Friday morning? We desire to see the Holy Spirit work in this church. Whenever we came here in 2014... The first thing that we said to the people was, our number one priority is to have the Spirit of God in this house. That's our, that's our only aim. If we can get the Holy Spirit in the house have, and let Him have His way, how many of you know everything's going to be a whole lot better in our life and in the church? But God works through people. Now, let me ask you a question. I'll just throw this out here. Do you think it's possible that we could hinder what God wants to do in the church by not desiring spiritual gifts? Do you think that we can hinder what God wants to do? I believe we can hinder what God wants to do. I look around me. I see uh, when we're going to go through these gifts, but I look around me and I see sometimes a gapping lack. Sometimes. And I'm thinking, Lord... <laughs> Use me. Flow through me. But even though these gifts are free, I want to tell you there's a price to pay for the anointing of God on our life. We, it's something we must desire more than anything. And I think, could it be, I'm just asking the question, could it be we're not seeing it on the level that we'd like to because maybe we're not hungry enough? See, the Scripture says that if we thirst after righteousness, if we hunger after righteousness, guess what? We're going to be filled. And there won't be any lack. We'll have all the fullness of God. Paul talks about that in Ephesians. That you'd be filled with, filled with all the fullness of God. How many of you know God wants to have activity on the earth? God wants to have activity in His church. And I'm not saying we have a bad church. I think we have an awesome, a wonderful church. But I'm saying we had not arrived. There's more that God wants to do in this church. There's more that God wants to do in you. You don't have a clue. We don't have a clue what the Holy Spirit wants to do through each one of us. God's no respecter of persons. The gift's for you. The gift's are for me. They're for all of us, okay? God loves the church. It's imperative that, that we desire these gifts. These gifts, they're powerful. They're awesome. They're incredible. The more I've been studying on them, I'm, think, I'm thinking, these are not just some pretty gifts that sit on a table. These gifts can change the course of history. 
God has to have a vessel to flow in and out of. He wants activity on the earth. Uh, Paul exhorts us to desire spiritual gifts. Um, We've got to desire them. It's my prayer. It's been my prayer today that um, tonight and next week that it will spark a fresh hunger in you and in myself to be used by God. And we'll begin to desire spiritual gifts that God would use us. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we woke up in the morning so full of God? Now listen, wouldn't wouldn't this be awesome? If we loved God so much and we hungered after Him so much that He he was our focus all week, like Pastor Barry preached Sunday, and like maybe we didn't even hardly pick up our phone (laughs) a whole day. You know how many times we pick our phone up? What if we just said... I'm not hungry for that. God, I'm hungry for you. And we woke up so full of God that in the morning, God said, okay, you know, as you go through your day today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to impart to you tools that you're going to need throughout your day to minister. You say, oh, I don't, I don't, I'm not a pastor. No, you minister. Don't you know that? You minister every day to your family, to, on the job, to people around you. And what if the gifts just begin to flow out of us as needed, as, as we needed them, and they were right there, and we just functioned in them? Wouldn't that be what? I'm going to tell you, this church would look different in three months. <laughs> we're talking about going to 300. We'd be talking thousands of people. If we would all just get so hungry for God. And I think, God, what's wrong with us? I'll tell you, yesterday, I came in here, I was sitting here, right over there where Nancy's sitting. And I sat there, and I just began to talk to the Lord. And I came to the altar, and I said, God, I repent. I repent. I don't want to hinder you and what you want to do through my life because I'm too distracted and too caught up in everything else. And I think I'm doing good. I mean, I have my prayer time every day. I mean, I do talk to the Lord all day, and I know I'm so grateful. We've heard our pastor talk about how he prays in the Spirit all day long, all the time. I mean, I thank God for a pastor like that. But let me tell you, we have, we, none of us have arrived. We've got to get to the place to say, God, I've got to have more. We sing that song, but do we, do we really, really mean that on the inside? God, I want more of you. And God delights in that. He delights in that because if he can find somebody like that, hey, it would be like the early church all over again. Have you read Acts? They operated in all these gifts. And the church exploded. And God wants to do it again. God hadn't changed. He wants to do it. He's waiting on us. Amen. We want these gifts in operation. We want everything he has for us because the scripture says it's not by might. See, we, we, have, we have staff meetings every week. <laughs> you know, we, get to, we had a staff meeting this morning. But we're smart enough to know that it's not by our might and it's not by our power, but it is by the Spirit of God. And we have to know that in our own personal lives. If the gifts are operating like they should in a church, then the church is going to be built up. The church is going to be edified. The church is going to be encouraged. The church is going to be comforted. I'm going to tell you, if the church ever needed strengthened, it needs strengthened today in this hour. You're the church. I'm the church. We all need to be built up. We all need to be encouraged. We all need to be comforted. You know, the scripture says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What if we were all strong in the Lord and in the power of his might? I'm telling you, our church would be, we, we would be buying property. We'd be building. We'd be doing something. We wouldn't be having church in here. See, I think it blows my mind. This blows my mind. When you read scripture, that God takes natural people and flows his supernatural power through them and changes, changes situations. Does that not blow your mind? We're just normal, regular, Christian, God-loving people. But God puts his supernatural power and presence in us and flows through normal people. Look at Elijah. James tells us in the book of James, Elijah was a man just like you and like me. But Elijah prayed. He loved God. He prayed. And what did, you know what God did through Elijah. He called fire down out of heaven. He, uh, he prayed that it wouldn't rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years. He, his prayer shut heaven up 
for three and a half years. He prayed again, and guess what? It started raining. And the scripture says he was just a normal man like you and me. But, but God, the supernatural working of an almighty God that he wants to work not just through Elijah, through you, through me, through the board of this church, through, through the pastors of this church, through the members of this church, through the children of this church, through everybody. He's no respecter of persons. Wow. Well, God says, given gifts to believers. They're imparted to us by God the Holy Spirit. No, not for us to get prideful about. That's where everybody gets in trouble. No, don't, you, don't we know we're just a vessel? And he flows through us. He flows through us. We read of the gifts in 1 Corinthians, the ones we're going to talk about. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. I'm not going to read those three chapters. But I just want to make a, a, a statement here. And many of you know this already. But if we would disregard the divisions of the chapters. And if we could just read 12, 13, and 14 with no verses and no chapters. You would see the continuity and how they flow together in love. That they have to operate and function in a spirit of love or there is no value at all to the gifts. And I think so many times we say, oh, the gifts are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 and in 14. And uh, we, don't, we, we think the love chapter is for something else. But it's not. It's all there together going together. Because 1 Corinthians 13 says that if we, if we speak with the tongues... And this is, a, this is one of the gifts we're going to get into them. But if we speak with tongues of men, and then, you know, there's tongues that men speak, and then there's tongues that angels speak. Oh, wouldn't that be cool if you could speak of all the languages of the earth that men speak, and you could understand them. If you could do that, wouldn't that be awesome? But wouldn't it also be awesome on top of that if you could speak the tongues that the angels speak? If I speak of the tongues of men, I speak of the tongues of angels. But if we're not operating in love, the scripture says you're just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You're, you're of no value at all. Forget the gifts. It don't, even, it don't even mean anything if you don't operate in love. And then it says, if you have the gift of prophecy, we're going to talk about that gift. If you understand all the mysteries. Now, I'm not just talking about a few mysteries. What if you understood all the mysteries of all creation, of all the world, every, all those mysteries? What if you had all knowledge? Now, that's, that's a big order right there. If you had all knowledge, what if you had all faith? I'm talking mountain-moving faith. What if you could do that? But it, the Scripture says if the gifts that are coming out of you, if they don't operate from a position of love, you are nothing. You're nothing. And then it says if you give everything you, you own, if you sold everything, your house, your cars, if you sold everything you owned and you gave all that money to feed the poor, even if you gave your body to be burned, but without love, there is absolutely no profit and no benefit. Zero. It's a big waste of everything. So that's a pretty clear directive there. It's, the church has got to flow in love. We've got to operate these gifts in love. If there's no love in my doing, there's no reward. They've got to function in love. Now, let's read. Let's talk about the gifts. And boy, time is flying by so quick. Okay. All right. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 through 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another work, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So the Holy Spirit d distributes the gifts as He wills. Now, uh, we have divided these up uh, for just for clarification to help you see them a little better. The revelation gifts, let's put that on the screen. These are the ones I want to talk about real quick tonight. The revelation gifts is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. That's the revelation gifts. The next order 
is, we'll talk about these next week, the gift of faith, the gift of healings, the working of miracles. Those are the power gifts. And then the last category would be the uh, vocal gifts, uh, uh, would be prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Tonight we're going to start with the word of wisdom, the revelation gifts tonight. We'll see how far we get. The revelation gifts, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Now, let's look at the word of wisdom. This is a word directly from the Holy Spirit to impart a revelation of God's word or the Holy Spirit's wisdom to a specific situation or problem. In other words, the word of wisdom gives a directive. It helps give us the right direction. Now, I want to stop right here and make a point. This is not the wisdom that we hear about in Scripture that, about, for daily living. Well, I'm not talking about that wisdom. Uh, It's not the kind of wisdom that we all exercise daily when we have our morning devotions, when we pray, when we meditate, when we study, when we worship. You know, that that wisdom is developed as you serve the Lord. Everybody understand that? That's different. That's not what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about tonight is a supernatural application of the Word of God into a situation knowing how to apply the Word. It's supernatural. It's nothing that you do on your own, okay? It's nothing that I can manufacture on my own, it's supernatural, it's from God. God the Holy Spirit to me. Um, now, notice this. It, God has all wisdom. His wisdom is vast and without limit. We know that. The, a word of wisdom, notice what it says. It's a word. It's not the whole. It's just a word. It's just a small, 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 small part of God's wisdom that he has, and he imparts a word to you when it's needed. Okay, everybody understand that for a particular situation. Uh, It appears in Acts that Stephen had the word of wisdom operating in his ministry. I want us to look real quick at Acts chapter 6, verse 8 through 10. And it says of Stephen here, It says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedom. I'm going to have to turn around. I can't read that far away. Uh, Okay. They were disputing with Stephen. Okay. They started to to dispute with Stephen. Now, uh, let me just stop here before we go to the next part, and let me explain to you what's going on. Uh, there, there, There came a council... They all got together, all the leadership of the church, to decide. um, No, I'm sorry. Let me stop here a minute. Go to Acts 15. Go to Acts 15 real quick. I got ahead of myself. So that that was one one example there of Stephen. But I think there was more there. Hang on a minute. 8 through 10. My computer messed up today at home, and I was not able to put my scriptures on my paper. So I apologize. That's why I'm having to either read them out of the word here. Okay. All right, go back to verse 10, Acts 6, verse 10. I want you to notice this, verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, talking about Stephen. So here you see that they were disputing, but they they could not resist the wisdom. So apparently he was operating from a word of wisdom here in this situation. Now I want you to look at Acts 15. Let's turn over to Acts 15. I think this is a great, great example here. Now, let me give you a little background. They had all come together. The church had come together for a great council. There was a dispute. There was something they needed to call a business meeting on. And so they all got together, the whole leadership of the early church, to decide this is what they were going to decide, what requirements were going to be placed upon these Gentiles that just got saved. Um, And so this was the business of the hour, and anybody... Everybody, anybody that was anybody, anybody that was somebody was at this general council. I mean, if we could see a snapshot of who was there, I mean, you would have been impressed. Um, All the leaders were present. John was there. James was there. Paul and Barnabas was there. All the elders, all the apostles, and the Jewish Christians were there. The ones that said the Gentiles had to be circumcised to be saved. And they said they also had to uh, follow the law of Moses to be saved. So they're all there. So I want you to get this picture. And so in the middle of this council, there was a heated debate. There was disputes going on. There was discussions. And so you get the picture. It was just lovely. Okay. 
And so in the middle of all of this human reasoning and going back and forth, if you look down in verse 13, I love it. You know, we love James. We, we spent a whole year talk, studying James. James begins to speak. And he begins to speak through the Holy Spirit a word of wisdom to this general council that had gathered together. Let's read in verse 13. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it, just as it is written. And then he reaches way back in and pulls out the prophet Amos and begins to quote Amos. And Amos says this, After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, James is talking, Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Now look what happened. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company. And he goes on down uh, and finishes that. So I won't finish that. So anyway, so here's what happened. James begins to speak a word of wisdom. And what happened? It was very clear, precise, and to the point. The Holy Spirit said through this word four things. He said, here's the four things that needs to happen. These Gentiles, they don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to follow the law of Moses. Here's what they need to do. Abstain from idols. Uh, abstain from fornication, sexual immorality. Don't eat anything that's strangled and don't eat anything with blood in it. Those were the four requirements. Now that was pretty precise and pretty to the point, wasn't it? And I want you to notice the impact it had on the church. Notice the impact it had on that council. God's mind was revealed in a moment that needed to be revealed because this was a turning point for the church here. God's mind was revealed. There was a clear understanding of what was required. Nobody was in question. It, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and it seemed good to them. And this word of wisdom brought harmony. It brought unity to the body. How many of you think, have you ever been in a business meeting when you thought, Lord, there needs to be a word of wisdom right now? <laughs> Thank God that hadn't happened in this church. But after that, guess what? And that it, was, it was over and the council ended. And they all left. If you read verse 22, go over to verse 22. It says here, well, we read that part. Let's go to verse 28. It says, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And then he repeats it all again. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. I love that. How wonderful to have the mind of God on a in a matter when you got a bunch of bickering going on and a bunch of disputing going on. Isn't it wonderful to have the mind of God? That somebody is so full of God that the Holy Spirit can operate through them through a word of wisdom and, and instantly everybody's in unity. Isn't that amazing? That's wonderful. How many of you think our church needs that? How many of you think it would be beneficial to, that the board of a church have that? that? That the church would have that? Yes. I think that's wonderful. Let's go to the next one. Um, the word of knowledge. This is the next gift men uh, mentioned, the word of knowledge. This word reveals knowledge about people, circumstances, or biblical truth. God has revealed something that's supernatural that there's no way you would have known it any other way. It's knowledge that you would never, ever, ever know. No matter how much you studied, no matter how, you know, you would, this is different. It's supernatural knowledge. It's, something, it's knowledge from God that only God knows, but he's going to share it with you, with someone, okay? Uh, I want you to read how Peter operated in this gift. Look, turn to Acts 4. This is a great story. Acts 4. Go to Acts 4. Let's go to Acts 4, verse 34. Now, uh, early, this is the early church. 
And here we go. It says, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. So this is what was happening. They were bringing their offerings. They were selling things, bringing the money into the church, laying it at the apostles' feet. Look at chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. This is the story. Let's just read it. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. So far, everything's great. That's great. They sold a possession. Verse 2. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And he did that as if he had sold the whole thing and he's given all the money, but he didn't. He was given part of the money, which he could have, he could have kept part of the money, but you just don't want to do what he did. And let's keep reading. Verse 3, uh, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? How did Peter know that? Nobody told Peter that. There's no way Peter should have known that in the natural. But the Holy Spirit operated through him through the gift of knowledge, and he knew that. And Peter goes on, while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Are we still going here? How many verses are we going? Yes. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And so here you go. She lies. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Then verse 11, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. I'm going to tell you what that proved to the early church. It proved to the early church that God was in their midst. That God was in their midst. And they lied. And they tried to deceive. And God revealed it. He revealed it. And you know what that did? That brought some sanctification to the early church. And it let them know God's a holy God. We don't lie. We have to be truthful. We have to be honest. We have to walk in integrity in our church. And it did the church a world of good, but they, it, sure, it sure made them afraid. Wouldn't that make you afraid? <laughs> made them afraid. God revealed to Elijah a word of knowledge when he was running from Jezebel. You know that story. And, and he gets in a cave and he goes, God, I'm the only one left. And God says, oh, no, you're not the only one left. I got 7,000 that hadn't bowed their knee to Baal. That's a word of knowledge. There's no way Elijah should have known that. But God revealed it to him. No, you're not the only one. I want to encourage you. I want to I comfort you today, Elijah. You're not the only one. There's 7,000 more that have not bowed to me. Look at John chapter 4. Let's go to ch John chapter 4. Remember Jesus at the well with the woman? John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 16. You remember that discourse? Jesus met that, that, that precious woman at the well. Look at this. Jesus said to her, go call, go, call your husband and come here. Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband in that you spoke truly. Who told Jesus that? You may say, well, Jesus, Jesus was God, and so he knew. Well, let me, let me remind you, he came as a man. The Bible says he emptied himself. You do know there was not one recorded miracle of Jesus before the Holy Spirit came upon him. That's, that's when his miracle ministry started. With it. He did nothing without the Holy Spirit. He did nothing without the Holy Spirit. And so, so the Holy Spirit moved through Jesus to where he had this information that a man like you and me wouldn't have it normally. Only if God told him. 
Okay, do you see that? Now let's go to the last one. We're getting ready to, to hang this up. The next one is discerning of spirits. Now, let me reiterate here. This is, all these gifts are supernatural. It's, it's, they're supernatural when they are needed, okay? Now, I have heard people say, and maybe you've heard this, they've said, well, you know what? I have the gift of discernment, or so-and-so has the gift of discernment. Well, I want, I want to help you see something here. That's not biblical. It's not called the gift of discernment. It's called the gift of discerning of spirits, okay? So let, let's talk about what this is. Um, it is the divine and supernatural ability to see the presence and activity of a spirit that motivates a human being, whether good or bad. It's the ability to recognize and identify and distinguish between various kinds of spirits that can confront, confront us. All right? Now, this is very important that we know how to do this, that we have this gift operating. I want to go real quick. It's not on the screen, but... Uh, Paul teaches us this. First Timothy chapter 4, he says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines. Look here, doctrines of demons. Do you think it might be beneficial in the church that this gift operates, that in the last days we know that there's going to be great deception, and, and we need to have the gift that it needs to be operating to where there's a discerning of a spirit saying, okay, what's behind this gift? What's behind this, this what I'm hearing right now? Is this from the Lord? Is this from the Holy Spirit? Is this, is this from the enemy? What, what is this? Because, see, you can give heed to deceiving spirits. They sound right, but it's not right. Everybody get that? Uh, so let's, let's talk a minute about this, the spirits that we're talking about. First of all, there's the Holy Spirit, okay? We have to discern. How many think it's good to discern the Holy Spirit when he speaks to you? We've talked about that for weeks. Uh, there's also angels that are spirits. You've got good angels. You've got bad angels, okay? There's also demons and unclean spirits. Then there's also the spirit of man. So the discerning of spirits discerns through all this. Which, who's really talking here? Is this God talking? Is this the Holy Spirit talking? Is this the enemy talking? Is this, is this a, an angel that appears as an angel of light? Because go back to what Paul says here. He says, in the last days, some's going to depart from the faith because they're hearing another voice. Okay? Um, see, this gift is imparted... Uh, I think Derek Prince said this. This gift is imparted to lift the veil that covers the spiritual world. It enables us to see as God sees. See, the scripture says, there's a verse that says uh, that, that, that man looks at the outward appearance. But where does God look? God sees the heart. God knows the spirit behind that person, the spirit behind that voice. Uh, this gift can protect a church from being deceived. Uh, we all minister in the spiritual realm. It's all around us. Don't you, uh, Ephesians six twelve. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're all familiar with this verse, but against principalities, against powers, against we, we've got that whole uh, the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians six ten. Now. Um, Jesus, as I said, and you'll, as we go through these gifts, as you read your Bible, you're going you're gonna to pick up on how Jesus operated in the gifts, how the Old Testament prophets at times operated in the gifts, how the New, church, uh, New Testament church operated in the gifts. And we're gonna, as we go through this, hopefully, you'll be able to recognize this. Um, John chapter 1, let's look at this, this instance of Jesus. We're about to, ready to close this up. Go to John chapter 1, verse 47. This is an interesting passage here. Look here. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. 
Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. See, now there was no external way to see into Nathanael's heart. (laughs) Uh, But Jesus, through the gift, through this gift, was able to discern that there was no guile in Nathanael. There was no deceit in him. Look at Acts 27. Verse, this is another great one. At verse 21 through 24. You remember Paul got on a ship headed to Italy. And a, and a powerful superstorm, you know, came up. And Paul tried to tell the captain, don't go. We don't need to go. And he wouldn't listen to him. And so let's read this, what it says here in Acts chapter 27, verse 21. It says, but long after abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So that's another example. What did Paul do? There was a lot of men on that ship, but not one of them saw that angel. But Paul had discerning of spirits, and he saw the angel. He was able to see into the supernatural realm, and he saw the angel and got a message. But he was the only one on the whole ship that was able to see that. Look at Paul at Philippi. Acts 16, Acts 16, verse 16 through 18. Let's look at this one. Acts 16, verse 16 through 18. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul greatly annoyed. Now let's just stop here. What she said was true. Look in verse 17. She's following them and she's saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. Is that not true? Yes. Who proclaimed the way of salvation. That was a true statement. But look here. But Paul, she did for many days, and Paul got annoyed. He got greatly annoyed. He turned and said to the Spirit... Look at that. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out of her that very hour. You say, what happened? Well, the spirit had pretended to be a friend, but he was an enemy. He was undercover. And he was an enemy in disguise. And the enemy was trying to identify Paul's message with the kingdom of darkness. And Paul discerned the true source and motive and cast out the evil spirit. Isn't that interesting? So you know what? It's not enough if somebody's speaking truth. We must have the gift of discerning of spirits to operate, especially in these last days, that we know the spirit behind what they're saying. And what is it? See, because if this girl could have made everybody believe, if he would have agreed with her, then they would have thought, well, it's just like what our culture is now. We'll just mix a little bit of that divination in with with what you got going on. And it would have ruined the gospel for Paul in that city. But Paul knew, he he discerned something is not right, even though she was speaking truth. I think that's very interesting. So, um, another example, and this is the last one, Acts 13. I won't even read it. Acts uh, 13, verse 8 through 11, Paul and Barnabas, they're at Cyprus. They were resisted by Emmaus the sorcerer. And Paul had this gift operating him. And, well, let's go ahead and read it. It's only a couple of verses. Let's read it real quick and then we're going to go. You see these gifts operating heavily in the early church. Look at verse 8. Uh, Emmaus, the sorcerer, withstood them seeking to turn the pronsco, the pronsco away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? 
And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. See, God has a message in these last days that he wants to get out, and the enemy wants to try to come in and steal it. And so do you, can you see just a little bit how that the Holy Spirit wants to help us in these last days? to function and not be taken out by the enemy. Do you see that? We're going to try to finish this up, wrap it up next week. I hope that you'll go home. I hope that you will will read these chapters. I hope you'll study these gifts. And uh, why don't we all stand? I hope you learned something tonight. Did anybody learn anything? (laughs) Do you understand now why, why the Scripture says desire spiritual gifts? Don't you, want to do, don't you want to desire spiritual gifts for your family, for your children, for your church, for your ministries? Come on, let's raise our hands. Father, we thank you tonight. God, we thank you for your presence in the church. God, we want you present at Lighthouse Church. Pastor Bob already said it. Where two or three are gathered, Father, you are already here. You are with us. And Lord, we want to be hungry to receive all that you have for us, God. Lord, that we may be productive. God, that we may make advancements for your kingdom on this corner and for the people that you have assigned to us in this church. And God, we just pray that you would would make us hungry, God, for spiritual things. God, I pray that, Lord. Only you can do that, God. I pray, God, that we we would put down, you know, we would put down our idols. That was one of the requirements of the early church for the Gentiles, that they should abstain from idols. God, maybe if we would put some of our idols down, we would have more time for you. I'm just saying, I don't know. God, I pray you'll work in me. I pray you'll work in this church and in every hungry heart tonight, Father. We pray that in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray that we would be blessed as we go. God, keep your hand upon us. Keep your hand of protection upon us, God. Let us be a blessing in your kingdom. Let us go out of here and encourage somebody. Let us build somebody up. Let us exhort someone, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord, for your great love for us and your great love for this church. In Jesus' name.